Glad you're here for week two of marriage. And if you missed last week, you gotta take some time and you gotta go watch uh, what we talked about last week because what I did is I unpacked the global picture, literally, of what marriage is. And it's so much more than just your relationship with, a, with, with your spouse. It is about the way God designed the world, uh, the way God put the world together. And what we looked at, and I'm just gonna hit it quick because we have a lot to go through today, uh, what we looked at is how when we see the scriptures and the story of creation, we see that marriage is a picture of God's will for the world, not just for the individuals that are sitting in this room or people who are married, but for how he made the world. He put heaven and earth together. That was the first marriage, God with us in the beginning. We were with him, and that was the marriage of heaven and earth. And from that, you saw all types of pairings, not just heaven and earth, but water and land and animals and vegetation, and animals with their kind, and then humans. And so we represent God's design for all of creation. And so that, that's a big piece when you start to understand that this is God's will, this is God's way, this is how he made the world, he made us to be in these relationships with one another. The other part we looked at is how marriage isn't just a picture of God's will for the world, it's a picture of God's love for the world. It's a picture of God's love. It shows us his desire to bring us back together. That what we see in the scriptures is that the world starts off heaven and earth together, and then there's the great divorce, heaven and earth are split, and from that, the world is broken. Death enters in, relationships suffer, families fall apart. The first family, uh, one son murdered the other, and that's all part of what happens when our hearts are far from God. And the last scene in the Bible, as it's kind of related to us, John looks up and says he sees uh, heaven coming down from, from this place up there where it's meeting earth and heaven and earth are coming back together, and he says heaven is like a bride meeting its groom because now we have the remarriage of heaven and earth. And so whatever it is that brings heaven and earth back together is because of God's love. And so when we look at Jesus, we see that he's the heaven and earth man, God in the flesh. So heaven and earth come back together, the beginnings of that in Jesus. His miracles are the manifestations and the sprinklings of the beginnings of heaven and earth coming back together. It's all of God's plan, and there's pop-up celebrations all throughout his life, and then he dies on a cross, and he resurrects gloriously and gives the Holy Spirit of God to the church of God, which is the beginnings of heaven and earth coming all the way back, and now the people of God are the temples that have the spirit of the living God in them, and that's all because of God's love. And so marriage is a picture of God's love for the world. Heaven and earth, you and me. Now, what I'm gonna do today is like I told you, and I, I want everyone in here, um, <clears throat> here's what I want you to do. I want every person to take notes today. Can everybody agree to that? Mm. Get out your phone and open up your notes, and if you're not a note taker, Today's the starting day. You need to take notes today. Now, if you're not married, you still need to take notes. 
And I understand that this series seems to be somewhat exclusive to those married, want to be married, have been married, gone through marriage. I understand that. You might feel left out. Please don't disengage. If anything, God's picture and plan for marriage can show you at least this, that every person in Christ is being transformed into the likeness of Christ. There's a transformation that takes place. We would all agree in the Christian life, I'm supposed to become more like Christ. You would agree to that, generally speaking. You would say yes. Well, what we're gonna look at today and what you've already read is that marriage is one of the places where it's absolutely impossible for you to do it right unless you're transformed, unless something happens in you, unless something changes in you. And so it, at the least, it's a place where you see radical transformation take place, and you should be interested in that from a general perspective as a Christian. God is doing something in marriage, and maybe it's not the exact something that he's doing with you, but it is something that he does in general for all of us in one way or the other. One of the phrases that I say to couples, because as I've told you, I'm doing this series based upon phrases and counseling that I do individually with people all the time. That's what's driving this whole six months that we're doing. We're doing a series on marriage and parenting and counseling, and we're gonna obviously talk about the resurrection in there at Easter time. But there are these things that I'm always sitting with couples with, whether it's they're, they're getting married, they've been married, they're wanting to get divorced, and one of the things that I always find myself saying to couples who are married is, you know you didn't have to get married. You didn't have to. You chose to get married. And oftentimes, when I say, you know you didn't have to get married, they're like, but we want to get married. But then when you go one step further to, what does it mean to be married? They go, I don't want to do that. And I go, oh, yeah, you mean it might be hard for you to stop going to that grocery store and go to the other one because that's the one that she wants you to go to? Can I tell you I've had couples in my office that are thinking about getting divorced because they want to go to a different grocery store? And I say, you know, you didn't have to get married. But when you signed up for marriage, what did you sign up for? You signed up to, to do something, right? Generally speaking, the vows that we speak when we get married, we all go, yes, for better, for worse, for sick, for poor. I promise to love you and seek out your needs and your desires, making them my special aim for the rest of my life. Of course, of course I'm in. And then it's like, well, that means you're gonna go to her house for Thanksgiving instead of your house. Oh, no, 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 no. And, I, and, and, and these types of things is just constant, just constant, this type of, that's not what I thought it meant. I didn't sign up for that. And so what I wanna do today is get down to the nitty gritty of how the big idea of marriage moves into our lives as it's related to what did you sign up for? Now, I talk about this all the time because it's part of my life. It's not something I'm being, uh, you know, trying to be arrogant about, whatever, but I, I love CrossFit, I do CrossFit, and this weekend the CrossFit Open launched. If you don't know what that is, go look it up. It's, it's a worldwide competition that's open to any person. You go to a CrossFit gym, they publish these three different workouts, one each weekend for three weekends in a row, and you do the workout, and if you post your score and you're high enough, you get to move on to the regions. Just like a Golf US Open, if you do well enough, you can make it to the top. And so what happens is you don't know what the open is gonna be. You don't know what the workout is. They publish it on Thursday night at like eight o'clock, or actually it was 3 p.m. this time, from Spain. And they do that, and then you have the whole weekend to do the workout, and they do that three weeks in a row. You don't know what the workout is gonna be. Nobody knows except for the people that are putting it all together. But you sign up before it's published. Now imagine signing up, paying your money, and then the workout comes, and you're like, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not gonna do that. It's like, well, what, 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 why'd you sign up? Why, what, you didn't have to sign up. You didn't have to do this. You must, wait a minute, you must not have known that this was possible. People that are in the open, they know. I mean, it's gonna be some series of movements that they've learned to one degree or another. So they kind of are going, I'm gonna sign up for this. So it would be absolutely ludicrous for someone to go to that and then say, I'm not doing this even though I signed up. You didn't know what you signed up for. Imagine just generally going to a gym, get, going to get your college degree, 
And you, you sign up, you're, I'm gonna go to school, I'm moving in the dorms, I'm paying tuition, I'm going. And they say, here's the classes. You need to take these 12 hours just to go through this semester and stay on track to finish in four years. And then you go, oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Why are, why are you here? Did you not know that signing up for that meant this? This is what it meant. So what we're gonna talk today about is what it means to say these marriage vows in the context of arguably the most profound, articulate, and controversial passage related to marriage all throughout the Bible, Ephesians chapter five, which you just read, which some of us read and go, oh boy, that sounds antiquated. Some of us read and go, oh man, this, what, is he, what is he gonna say today? Is he gonna say that the wife just needs to be the subservient follower and just listen to the dictates of her husband and that is the way the Christian marriage works? And some of you are, are, are sitting in here going, I hope that's what he says. And some of you are sitting in here going, man, if I hear more of that, that, that's maybe hurt me. Maybe there's some wounding around that. Maybe you're in a dysfunctional relationship and you're going, it feels like if my husband gets that message, it's just gonna make it worse. And so what I wanna do is I wanna show you this passage and understand what Paul was up to when he's writing to the Ephesians about Christian marriage. It's not what you thought. You see, one of the things that is happening during the time of Jesus, after he leaves, in the first hundred years of the church, is it's still during the rule of the Roman Empire. And so the Roman Empire is the, is the kind of the platform, it's the, it's the, it's the formation, it's, the, it's the, the, the articulation of what rulership and leadership looks like. Rule with an iron fist. Move into the city with the chariots and the infantry and the brute strength. And that, at the time of Christ, was the picture of authority and the picture of leadership. Now, I want you to think for a second about the nature of Jesus' leadership versus Roman leadership just what you know generally. How incredibly different is it? How is Messiah different? How does he rule? When we're talking about seeking the kingdom of God and knowing the truth of Jesus, when there's a conflict, Jesus doesn't roll in the tanks. He sends out the meek and he sends out the poor. Leadership, according to Jesus in his life, and Paul's perspective that he's sharing with the Ephesians, is very, very different than what the world at that time understood. What was, what was commonly known in terms of families was the pater familias. You can go look this up. It was just the father of the family. That's what that means, father of the family. And in that kind of way in their culture, the head oldest male of any family had ultimate authority. It meant that the people that were in his family were in ways viewed as second-class citizens. And the father, if he didn't like his wife, he could dismiss her. Uh, there, there are intense stories of execution, of sending away. I mean, it, 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 was, it was anything goes because that's the leader. The leader has the brute strength, the leader makes the rules, the leader is in charge, the leader has the, the title, and what the leader says goes, and if you don't do it, you're in trouble. What the Christian gospel does is it changes that for every part of society, including marriage. It changes leadership to a totally different thing. What Jesus does in most of the New Testament is he says, by the way, now in Christ, Jews and Gentiles can come to the same table. Now, people of different backgrounds and different uh, faith systems, if they come in Christ, they all can come to the same table. Those that are the servants or the slaves are invited to the table with the master. And wives are now invited to the table with the husband, or the husband is called to leave his inaccurate view of leadership 
Where you rule with an iron fist, you have all the authority, the title is what it's all about, to a relationship of mutual submission. What Jesus and what Paul does in Ephesians is radical. He puts in front of the world that the nature of Christian marriage as it was intended from the very beginning is mutual submission. Here's why he talks mostly about men, because men in Ephesus and all over the world were the ones who needed the most correction. They were the ones who had a misunderstanding of leadership. Let me put it this way. If when you think of leadership, you think, I have the rules, I have the title, they need to submit, you don't have a Christian view of leadership. The Christian view of leadership is not to control, it's not to coerce. It's about setting an example. It's about inviting people in. Men have the profound responsibility to take their God-given gifts of strength and direction, and what they're supposed to do is lead the way in self-giving sacrificial love, not impose brute strength and authority. N.T. Wright said it this way, I'm a big fan of N.T. Wright if you don't know that. And within marriage, the guideline is clear. The husband must take the lead. But what, but what does that mean? Though he is to do so fully mindful of the self-sacrificial model which Messiah has provided. As soon as taking the lead becomes bullying or arrogant, the whole thing collapses. So, the heads of the household, that means the lead sacrificer. Oh yeah, it means the lead sacrificer. It means they're responsible for the spiritual health of the family, not by force, power, demand, or control, but by service and example. Authority is not the picture. The leader leads by laying down his life, his time, and his energy. You can't take up Christ's call to lead and not follow his giving it all to lead. If you are not, if you are sure you want the authority, are you sure you want it? You wanna have it all? Truly taking up the Christian call of being husband in marriage means authority and responsibility. Responsibility to empty yourself for the sake of the needs of your family. If you have any other ideas about what authority means, you got the wrong idea. If you think the epitome of being a, a husband in a Christian marriage is getting the final word, being the tiebreaker, and making all the rules, you got the wrong idea when it comes to authority. Here's what the passage starts out with. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The picture of Christian marriage is a man offering all he has to be the lead sacrificer to lift up the needs of his family and the wife submitting together. They, they're, bo they're both supposed, supposed to submit to one another. Here's what a great marriage will sound like. Where do you want to go to dinner? Where do you want to go to dinner? Can, can I get an amen for some husbands out there that know that's true? If you, don't, if you don't know that's true, then we got a lot to learn. That's marriage. Where do you want to go to dinner? Where do you want to go to dinner? Well, I really want to go where you want to go. Well, I, I, don't, I really just, I'm, I'll stay out of it. I don't even care. I just wanna go where you wanna go. No, really, I don't care where you think about it. You really want me to think about it? Okay, I'll think about it. Let's go to Hudson 29. I don't really wanna go there. That's fine, where do you wanna go? <laughs> do you see? One of the Christian virtues is consideration. To be considerate means you'll consider it. Everything, all of it. Your job and that's why today is for the husbands if you didn't get this. Now wives, you need to understand, your job is the same. Laying down your life, your skills, talents, and strengths to be a lead sacrificer in what you have to bring wellness and love to the marriage. 
That's the picture. So here's why I do this with people. Because when I sit with people and they're get, we're in the minutia because it's about like whose house we're going to Thanksgiving, which is real, but it's, that's where it gets to. That's where the rubber meets the road. Or it's way more insidious than that. It's, 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 it gets bad, right? It's something nasty, whatever. I go, let's back up. You know you didn't have to get married. But when you signed up for marriage, you signed up for self-giving love. That's what it is. Oh, I said the vows, but how do the vows move into my life? Here's the thing I'll tell you that's so true. When I explain that picture of marriage, and we really get to it, because I'm gonna give you some handles for exactly how you can start doing this. When I explain that picture, and anyone comes in that already knows that, and the wife or the husband confirms, that they do that for me. They do that for me. It's not, we're not there talking about their marriage, we're talking about something else because typically their marriage is okay. Whenever a person is in a relationship with a companion who genuinely operates out of the idea that leadership means the lead sacrificer, means the one who leads the way to give what they have, to spend their life. I've never met a wife in particular who, who has a husband that's like that and goes, I don't really like what he's doing. Every time it's like, he's an amazing husband. He's an amazing husband. So, do you see the picture here? We're moving away from this idea, this even in, in, in this century, we still have this idea of authority. I'm the tiebreaker, I'm the leader. You, that's the wrong thing. That's the wrong focus on what it means to be the leader. The leader means I'm leading the way in sacrifice. What does Ephesians 5 say? You need to love your wife the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. What is that a picture of? Is that a picture of how the wife is dirty? No, that's an example. The church is all of us, and we're all sinful and broken, all right? We need Jesus to lay down his life for us so that we can become whole again. It's, it's not saying that wife, women in the world are like the wife the way the church is, and she's the dirty one, and he's the pure one. It's saying that the example of how a marriage works is when you sacrifice whatever you need and can for the betterment of the person that you're in a relationship with. That applies to the wife too. This is why he goes, and so you know, this is why the man would leave his father and mother, to cleave to his wife, because the two become one flesh. Why in the world, if you understand that you are now one in Christ Jesus, would you think that your side holds the 51% of the shareholding and she's the 49. That's not it. You're one and you both lay down your life for one another. That's the Christian view. Now there are people that would hear this and go, oh, Joel, this is a wimpy. That's a wimpy Jesus you're talking about. Okay, is it really? Do you see Jesus kind of wielding the iron fist? I don't. I see him turning the other cheek. I see him being accused, and I see him telling, go make peace with everybody. I see him go make, be peacemakers. The one time that Jesus has a bite in his tone is when there's authorities saying that the way he is interpreting compassion and love is not the right way. You got it wrong. Here's what it is. I'm the Lord of the harvest. Let the people who are hungry eat. That's my heart, and I will stand up to those that take away from the broken and the wounded and the needy. That's who Jesus stands up to. Other than that, his entire disposition is of self-giving love. What does the one who has all the authority do? He gives it away. He lays it down. You, if you wanna be in a marriage, that's the picture of marriage. Laying down your life, giving up your desires. And so I know it's like, oh yeah, we believe in that. Let's dig into that. Now again, I believe the way Paul writes the passage is because the biggest adjustment needs to come to the man. But it starts off with mutual submission. This is both parties that have to do this. So, Here's what you signed up for when you signed up for marriage. Marriage means you signed up for daily, intentional, self-giving actions. Write it down. I'm gonna wait. Marriage means you signed up for daily, say daily, 
I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not one of the preachers that makes you say everything out loud again. But on this one, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm gonna save us some time in a meeting in the future. Okay, you need to write this down. Because you're gonna come into my office and I'm gonna go, uh, uh, were you in there? And you're gonna go, yeah. I'm gonna go, did you write it down? And you go, yeah. I'll go, let's say it again. <laughs> Marriage means you signed up for daily, say intentional, self-giving actions. Here's another way to say it. Marriage means you signed up for investing daily in your spouse's strength, success, and wellness. Now, when you hear that, who's on board with that? Right? That's what we're on board for. And again, when, when it's talking to the husband, you know, that wives, David makes that joke about, I'm so, she needs to hear this. And he's, you do gotta get in that mindset. The part that's written to the husband is written to the husband. Wives, it's not your job to make him come around. Praise the Lord, he's listening to this. Wives, husbands, your job to let her hear what God has to say. And we'll talk a little bit more about the steps leading into it because this is the type of thing that if you haven't agreed upon it in the most articulate sense that I'm doing right now with the most precise language, then you shouldn't get married. But you're in a marriage, and now God can do this amazing work and bring heaven and earth together the way he will. Marriage means you sign up for daily intentional self-giving actions. I heard Chris Rock say, marriage is easy. Oh boy, I'm gonna do the voice. He, I won't say all his other words. Marriage is easy. He, goes, the only, he says the only time marriage is hard is when one person is working. He goes, if one person is working, marriage is hard. He goes, two people can move a couch really easily. Isn't it true? Try to move a couch by yourself. You can't. You need a partner. You need someone to move the couch with you. Both parties have to sign up for moving the couch every day, intentionally, at the expense of themselves. That's the Christian view of marriage. That's how it works. Ryan said this in a, in a meeting this week. He said it's way harder to die daily than it is in general. Everybody signs up for the general dying. I take you to be my, to love you, to please you, and give you, everybody signs up for that because you get to wear a pretty dress and all the people are there and there's good food half the time. But you sign up, right? I mean, you're, you're in. The daily intentional, like, ooh, that thing. So let's talk about it. A couple things, write these down. These daily intentional self-giving actions are determined by four things and you can kind of extrapolate plenty out of this and there's more where this came from. This is a kind of cluster of, I would say, 10 of the leading experts in marriage, both secular and Christian, put into my own simplification. The first one is this. To be, you have to be a student of your spouse's needs. That's the first thing. In order to be intentional, in order to give sacrificially daily, the first thing is you have to be a student. Okay, so you think to yourself, like if you were signing up for you know, going to college and you were gonna be a biology student and you go to your you know, pre-med, whatever it is, the first class, biology 100, whatever it is, you're thinking, I'm gonna learn everything in this book. In order to serve your spouse, you think, I gotta learn everything in this person's life. I'm gonna be so curious, I'm gonna figure out what they need. My disposition is I see myself as God has created me in some way to bring about the, the help that this person needs to make it through life. So I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna study. Here's the things they're great at. Now I'm not talking about you're just like, oh, I really like them and they make my heart flutter. I'm saying you study. Like you become a student, you become like an expert. You could do like a TED talk on your spouse's needs and wants and desires. And you're like, I know, man, I know she loves Jenny's ice cream. I know she needs time away from her mom. I know she needs a walk with the dog. I know she needs to go to bed by eight o'clock. I know, I mean, you can just write it down and you can say it back. And then when he or she is caught in the thing where they don't know what's going on, you go, I know you need to go to bed. 
I know, I know. And they go, yeah, you do. Yeah, that's what I need. You become an expert. You study them so finely that nobody knows them like you. And nobody could supply their needs the way you do. Now, do you just stop right there? How many of you become a student? How many of you got married and thought, this is just the beginning, this is one-on-one, I'm gonna start studying this person, I'm gonna take five years and I'm gonna become, uh, get a PhD in you, baby. You understand how different this is from a disposition? So, so what do you wanna do? What do you think? What do you, what do you what's going on with you? Why, what made you cry? What made you feel that way? Why are you, I wanna know, like, what do you, where do you wanna go for vacation? Where do you wanna stop? Where do you, everything, I just wanna know everything about you so that I can become this, like, cradle of love for you. A student. So, students write things down. Students take tests. You need to do this. How well do you know them? The newlywed game. That's the whole point, right? If you haven't become a student of your spouse's needs, it's gonna be very difficult to do daily self-giving actions that are intentional. Here's another one. This is where it starts. This is where it gets real tight. This is like you do this and it will just change everything immediately. This is, a, this is worth so much money. You should tithe more because of this one. This is worth so much. I should, I should not actually say this. I should make you pay for it. It's so good. This is it. This is number two. Ask daily how you can help. Okay? Break it down. Every day. You ask, what can I do to make your day better? Wives, raise your hands if you would like that, or if you like that, because he already does it, just to get him off the hook. Raise your hand, right? Every day. Fellas, listen, man, if we wanna talk about we love Jesus, yes, we do, we, love, we, we wanna talk about that, but we don't wanna wake up and when our feet hit the ground, go, I'm married to someone that I'm supposed to give self-giving daily acts of love to, I better find out what's on her mind. If you're not signed up for that, why'd you sign up for this? What you, what, what, this is what it is. Oh, I don't, I don't do that, I'm gonna wake up and get my Cheerios, whatever. You didn't sign up for Cheerios. You signed up to be married. So every morning you wake up. How are you? How are you doing? What can I do today to help make your day a better day? And it's genuine. Maybe sometimes you wait till one in the afternoon. Checking in on you. I wanna know, do you need anything today? Maybe it becomes so, so, I mean, just think about this. You keep doing this until you already know the answer, you do it, and more, and your wife is happy all the time. Why is she happy? He takes care of me, he knows everything I need, he does what I want him to do before I ask him. You know, this is true, right? Well, I went through this, my wife just kept putting stuff on the stairs. I thought we were storing things on the stairs. What does it mean? When you go upstairs, Take it up, put it where it goes. My wife wants me to do the dishes, right? Do, should I spend my whole life wondering if she wants me to do the dishes? No, no, you do them, they're done. Because you've studied, you already know, you already do it, you got all the stuff knocked off the list, now what else can I do? I'm like, what else can I do? You know, you're, you know what the disposition of marriage is to really make it work? Is you do all the stuff you know, you ask about the stuff you don't know, and you just get to this place where you spend an entire day. Yesterday I was up at five in the morning. I had to get a video ready for my son's basketball celebration. I had to coach two games. I had to come back, set it all up, get 40 people at the Rusty Bucket. I had to set up all the sound. I had to get a video. I had to do all this stuff. I come back home. It's nine o'clock by the time I got home. I've been up since five o'clock. And because I've been trying to do this, and I'm, I, I, my wife sent me a text. I'm proud of you. You're, you're, you're doing healing stuff today, teaching what you're teaching today. So I am, I am doing this. I'm not just saying that, but I'm not perfect. I almost made her 
do a video that said he does some of this, because that's the truth. <laughs> but here's the disposition of a husband who is ready, and I don't do this all the time, but you're in bed, you're ready to go to bed, you're exhausted, and you think, if she asks me to take the dog on a walk, the answer's yes. I wanna do more, because that's what I signed up for. Come on, she didn't. <laughs> Asking every day, how can I help? Here's the next one, number four. Number, number three, <laughs> plan connection ahead of time. Plan all types of connection ahead of time. Now, typically what we do is we go to intimacy and, and the sexual connection. And that's fine. Plan, you can plan on that. You should. But you should plan on all types of connection. John Gottman, actually, his research, he's the kind of the most authoritative voice in, in the world in terms of research related to marriage. He studied 40 couples for 40 years. And he found out um, that really intimacy is about every moment of your relationship. Every moment. So foreplay has this idea of sexual intimacy, but I want you to back away from that and think of, think of this idea of just constantly connecting over all the things and viewing that as a waltz that is part of the celebration of your life. So you're connecting around who's going to the grocery store and you're connecting around who's gonna pick the kids up and you're connecting around, can you finish this out or pay these bills or whatever, and every single moment. And then in all of that, you're planning for connection. One of the things about my wife is she likes to connect around the dog. That's some, some weird. I don't mean what it... <laughs> I came out wrong. She likes to pet the dog at the same time as I do. We like to kind of be around the dog, and we kind of, without verbal interaction, just kind of engage with the dog. And so we kind of like plan on times to walk the dog together, a time of connection. You're planning on having those conversations. When are you gonna have that conversation about the schedule? You see, when you really care about intentional actions, you're planning on connecting. That includes, you know, you know what the lead uh, special uh, authorities on, on marriage say? 90 minutes. You have to spend 90 minutes a week of intentional planned time of connection with your spouse in order to have a successful marriage. So, you cannot, that will not happen if you don't plan on it. So you're planning on date night. You absolutely have to have a date night. You absolutely have to have the time where it, there's no distractions. And both of you have to lead it. The wife needs to say, I wanna connect, let's go to dinner, let's go with those friends, let's get the kids to the parents. Let's call and talk, I'm checking in with you today, can we talk on the phone for 10 minutes in the middle of the day to connect? You know, oh, I did a series when the church first started, there's a scripture that says, plans fail for lack of counsel. With many counselors, plans succeed. So do you plan on having a good marriage? Well, of course I do. Well, then what are your plans? If you plan on having a good marriage, but you don't have plans to make marriage good, you won't have one. There has to be a plan. It needs to be articulated, needs to be discussed, needs to be repetitive, needs to have a cycle to it that, that makes sense. One of the things about romance that I think people misunderstand is we think that romance is that original blossom in the garden, in the orchard, romance the perfume, the, the aroma, the beginnings, the spring, right? Romance is never, ever, ever supposed to just be those first fruits. Romance should be the first fruits on, of an orchard that you strategically grow through planning over your entire life. You want the one apple tree or you want 50 acres of it? The beginnings of romance, ooh, this is a good fruit. I want more of this. 
If you don't go plant and you don't go grow and you don't make plans to, to irrigate, to water, to connect, then you're just gonna have that one. You gotta grow it. Not momentary, immature beginnings that eventually die. Romance is when every type of connection is healthy and growing. Number four, and this is, we'll get into over the next couple months more than ever, but one of the most important parts about daily intentional self-giving actions is your reactions, reactions. And so in order to have a thriving, growing relationship with someone, you have to plan your responses ahead of time. This is good. You have to plan on it. So this is a little bit of, you better know you. If you don't know you, then you're in trouble in a marriage. Because it's your job to know what makes you mad. It's your job to know what frustrates you. It's your job to know what makes you sad. It's your job to know what might make you overreact. Your feelings are your responsibility and so are your responses, not theirs. In most marriages, what we do is when they do that thing, it makes me feel that way and if they didn't do that thing, I wouldn't do that thing. That's dysfunctional. Healthy human beings understand what's going on in them. Why do I feel this way? Why do I respond this way? You need to be able, in a good relationship, to be able to anticipate your negative, bad reactions to circumstances and decide how you're gonna manage that so that your voice doesn't raise, so that conflict and anger doesn't explode and the relationship gets worse. There is no, there is no good that comes from shouting. You know this? It is not good for you, it's not good for them, it's not good for the kids, it's not good for the neighbors, it's not good, it's never good. And so you need to be able to process your emotions and maybe you need to shout, but if you wait for when you get triggered, prodded, poked, and then you just respond because of the way you feel, you have way more work to do with you. So you have to figure out your responses. You need to start writing things down. You can write down stuff like this. What makes me angry? What does he do that makes me mad? Write them down. When he says that, when he doesn't do that, when he's whatever. And figure out how to manage through that so that when it happens, you can take a deep breath, you can count to 10, you can leave the room, you can go on a walk so that it doesn't get the best of you and bring the worst into your marriage. You have to plan your responses ahead of time. You gotta be gentle. And if you can't, if you got this kind of fierce thing going on in you, you gotta, you gotta go work through that. You gotta talk to somebody about that. You gotta pray. And it's okay to be in a relationship where the language turns into soft, kind interactions around your feelings as opposed to explosive nightmares that you have to put everything back together and then talk about what happened. But here's what's healthy. You know, when you say that, it makes me feel very angry. It makes me feel scared. It makes me feel frustrated. I need to step away from this conversation right now so it doesn't get worse. Then when you're calm, you come back to a relationship and you go, you know, when we had that conversation, can we talk about that? It makes me feel a certain way. Can we talk about how to do that differently? Now, here's the thing. This stuff sounds like pie in the sky. It can, because it takes two people moving the couch in order to do it. And there's a lot of skills. And one of the weeks in this, I'm gonna talk about conflict specifically. But in order to have Christ as the, the, the real model for your marriage, you have to plan your response ahead of time. And here's the last thing, and this isn't one of those four. Marriage means you signed up for something you cannot do without supernatural help. So all these things that I just said, all these things involve order, they involve discipline, they involve the fruit of the Spirit, they involve wisdom. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ 
where you are constantly pursuing his likeness and you are daily grinding away at what it means to lay down your life, marriage will be a virtual impossibility for you. It won't, it won't work. And I believe that's why the statistic about 50% of Christian marriages don't work, so what's the difference? The difference is, is that 50% of people that call themselves Christians aren't actually committed to a Christian marriage. The ones that do this, they do really well. Do you know you can be happy at times in a marriage? You can. You can. Like I've said before, you're not supposed to always be happy. That's not the goal. The goal is purpose. The goal is God's design. The goal is living a life that has meaning and results in something significant. You, you say, oh, I want to be happy all the time, but I want to make sure that my kids have a great life. You know how much you have to spend in order for your kids to have a great life, you're not always gonna be happy. It takes a lot. But what comes from it is the fruit of something that matters. And so, marriage means you signed up for daily, intentional, self-giving. You didn't have to do this, but this is what you signed up for. So next week, come back and... I'm going to talk about the nature of your heart as it's related to how to be in a marriage and or I'm going to talk about the blame game where you think it's always someone else's fault. I don't know which one yet, but we'll come back and we'll talk about it. Let's pray for a minute. God, thank you so much for marriage. Thank you so much for this practical uh, stuff. Thank you so much for the book of Ephesians. Thank you for the adjustment that's made in the way that humans are supposed to interact. Help us to come together in the name of Jesus. Help us to exemplify your self-giving love in our most important relationships. And Father, as we grow and we follow you, we ask for your grace and mercy as we stumble and fumble and lose sight. And we thank you that you give us the opportunity to have a newness every single day. New mercy, new time to follow you. We love you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you guys next week. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your prayer requests. We want you to text the number below and say hi. Thank you so much for watching.